Uh, and that you then ask the infant, what was the goal of this action? The five-month-old will tell you the goal was that yellow blanket, not the purple object that's on it. So just a few scattered examples say, you know some of what we know, they don't know uh, by any means uh, all of what we know. Now, perhaps less obviously, if you look within a domain at what infants seem to know, uh, contrasting with what they don't know, what they seem to know looks systematic and principled. So in the case of inanimate, solid, manipulable uh, bodies, objects, they seem to know about basic spatiotemporal constraints, like how each object uh, moves and how objects interact with, uh, with each other. So they know that objects aren't going to suddenly like eBay break, break in two. Two distinct objects won't merge together. Objects will trace connected paths over space and time. Uh, so there won't be gaps in their pads, and there also won't be intersections, so that there's a point in time where two things are occupying the same space. It's a solidity uh, constraint. And objects will interact on contact and only on contact. So uh, those are um, things they seem to know about objects. If we turn from objects to agents and their actions, uh, their knowledge all, again, looks systematic and principled. I'm sorry, uh, uh, Gergo uh, Chibra isn't here anymore because he's done a lot of the prettiest work on this, but if a young baby sees a person reaching over a barrier toward a ball but not quite getting to the ball, uh, uh, their reactions to subsequent events provide evidence that they've interpreted the goal of this action as the ball, and they interpreted the indirect path of the action as resulting jointly from the constraint of solidity, you can't pass through this barrier, you've got to go around it, and efficiency. This is the simplest, most direct action that such a person in this circumstance would take. So if you take the barrier away, they don't expect to see the same trajectory. They expect to see it more direct and efficient. So what we see here are a set of two different sets of principles, each of which can uh, uh, productively apply to a fairly broad range of phenomena and sets of principles that are distinct from one another. And the distinctness of those principles provides the first reason to think that babies may be reasoning differently about inanimate objects than they are uh, about agents. Well, one last thing about reasoning in these domains. Uh, when they confront an object that conforms to the principles that they apply, so an object that moves continuously through space as a cohesive body, or a person who acts efficiently with, uh, on unobstructed paths with respect to goals, they still show limits on their reasoning uh, 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 concerning the kinds of information that they will take into bear on the problem. Uh, so staying with objects, uh, if asked a question like how many objects are in a scene, where does one object end and the next begin, uh, beautiful research by uh, Susan Carey and Fei Shu shows that they'll use spatiotemporal but not other kinds of information about objects to answer those questions. So in a situation like this, this is actually a study of ours, They'll use the fact that there's nothing moving between these two screens to infer that if one thing goes behind, they see one thing go behind and then they see something that looks just like it coming out, there's actually two things back there, not one. But Shu and Carrie showed if it, instead there's one wide screen and first a truck comes out and then an elephant comes out, they won't use the featural differences or the difference in time uh, or any other conceptual distinction for sort of 10 month old infants that will distinguish the vehicle from the animal, for example, to infer that there's two objects back there. Their representation of object number is indeterminate in this case. It could be two, uh, it could be one. So that's a limitation on the object system. There's also an interesting limitation on the system for representing action. So uh, Lisha Spoppin, the same, Lisha Spoppin went on to great fame uh, uh, studying the uh, neighbor home homesigners. Uh, did an earlier study with me where she asked, uh, if you reach repeatedly for this object, uh, infants will infer that your goal is that object, but how do you individuate that? How do they individuate that object over successive trials? And research had already shown that if you take away all spatiotemporal information, you simply show this event, then cover the whole screen and reverse the locations of the two objects, then the infant will expect the reach to go to the new location where there's an object with the same features. In other words, using some properties of this object, maybe the fact that it's a bear, the kind membership of the object, or maybe just the fact that it's brown and fuzzy. 
uh, to specify the goal of this reach. On the other hand, if you have two objects that look alike, but you present good spatiotemporal information, so you don't lower a screen, you show the infant that you're going to continuously move this guy from here to here, then the question is, where will this reach go? Will it go to the one that's the same spatiotemporally a continuous individual that the uh, person reached for before? Answer is no, they're not using that. So you can see there's a double dissociation here between the information used to individuate inanimate objects in an object reasoning context and the system used to individuate actions in a context where there are agents who are acting with respect uh, to goals. And those kinds of those are the kinds of differences that I think give us the strongest reason to believe that babies have multiple systems of knowledge, not just a single general domain general way of making sense of what's going on around the world, uh, systems of knowledge. Um, and I actually think there's evidence for at least five such systems and maybe six. My examples so far have all come from objects and agents, but I think number uh, is another one. Uh, and by number, I mean uh, numbers, uh, approximate number, the ANS, I think it's called on our poster, uh, approximate number uh, system, a uh, ratio limited sensitivity to uh, numerical magnitudes. A place system focusing on distance and direction that I already mentioned, and a system for analyzing the shapes of objects and also two-dimensional uh, visual forms, which unlike the system for representing places, focuses on relative length and angle, different geometrical properties in the place system. I also think there may be a sixth system for representing um, uh, social and reasoning about the social world. Who's a good social partner for me? How do different people behave in a social interaction? But the evidence there is much scarcer, and I'm not going to say much about it. I'll keep it on slides from time to time, but I won't be giving any examples of that today. Now, I think that the contrasting limits on performance that one sees in each of these uh, domains, at least the first five, give us uh, a useful handle on each of these systems. I'll be talking about that handle as a set of signatures of each of these systems. Signatures that allow us to ask whether the same systems exist in other creatures, whether they're recruited in other tasks, whether we find them in other ages, whether we find them across cultures, and uh, so forth. Um, so let me start with the question of uh, species specificity. Can we use signatures on any of these systems to ask, are humans the only creatures who represent things in the ways uh, that we do? Uh, let me give us an example now, switching from objects and agents uh, to the place representations guiding navigation. Now, I said that uh, children figure out where they are in an environment by analyzing the distances and directions of extended surfaces in the environment. So if you put them in a room that I haven't uh, diagrammed here, but Nora can talk about it. You showed us a picture of one, in fact. A rectangular room with fully enclosing walls, and you hide something in one location, say here, and then you spin the child around so they're disoriented, and they have to, the question they have to answer is, where am I, so they can get back to that hidden object. They will use the relative distances of these walls and the uh, directional relation between the walls at different distances and particular corners to go, for example, to a corner that's left of one of the more distant walls to find the object where it is. The question now is though, what counts as a wall? What counts as an extended surface? What do these distance and directional measurements get applied to? Okay? And um, uh, in an attempt to address that uh, question, we took this fully enclosed rectangular room and started keeping it apart. Took off the ceiling, still worked. Took off to uh, lowered the walls to the point where the kid could look over, still worked. Mm -hmm. Lowered them still further, and long story short, you can bring it all the way down to a two millimeter high a uh, picture frame on the ground, and the child will still use the distance relations such that, you can see is here, if something is hidden here, they will look for it after they're disoriented in these two corners rather than those two. So they can use very small surface perturbations. What's more, there don't even have to be any sudden changes in orientation of surfaces. You can use smooth bumps instead of uh, a, an abrupt two centimeter protrusion, and they'll still succeed. But if you go down lower than two centimeters and you just have this uh, uh, surface that contrasts in brightness, highly perceptual, uh, perceptually salient contrast in brightness, uh, of the same shape as the rectangle over here, now the kids fail and you've hidden 
something in one corner, they'll search the four corners equally. They'll also search the four corners equally if you present a rectangle that's specified by just long columns of four corners. We ran that because there's an awful lot of studies of navigation in both bees and birds that say columns are really useful for specifying where nectar is, if you're a bee, or uh, for specifying where you buried food yesterday, if you're a bird. So we know that the animals use these sources of information. We also know that children detect both of these features. The reason we know that is that if you hide something in one, one corner or one of these columns, they will only search corners and they'll only search columns. So they're detecting this information, they're remembering it, they're using it. What they're not doing is applying this shape description to it, this distance and direction shape description, because they go to the four columns. That was very long when did it mean? But my point was, this is a set of quirky signatures that we see in children. If, if the same signatures, if, if this is a system that's unique to us, we should not see the same signatures in other animals. Uh, so here's a test with chicks, one of those species that really like columns for some purposes, save for uh, manipulations. Otherwise, different paradigm, the chick, the chick is imprinted on an object that we'll call mom. Then the chick's put in the center of this array, and poor mom uh, goes out in one direction or another, and you're going to see what the chick will do to follow them. Uh, and we see the same pattern of success in the other chick that we see. So that's the kind of finding one would want more than just this one isolated experiment. But it's the kind of finding that gives us some reason to think that the system that we're seeing is, is not humans at all. Uh, it's an ancient system of the sort that Tecumseh talked about uh, the other day uh, that we share with many other animals. Okay. Uh, now, uh, place representations aren't the only representations that we can apply the strategy to. When we apply it uh, to other systems, what I think we see is that none of the systems that have been tested systematically, the social stuff hasn't been tested systematically, but wherever systematic tests have been done, it looks as if the performance of many non-human animals is strikingly similar to the performance of human infants on these tasks, whether it's representing an object or to, uh, inferring the goal of an action, representing a number, and so forth. Lots of similarities. Uh, capacities don't seem to be unique uh, to humans. Okay, now on the one hand, that's too bad. We want to know what the sources of our uniqueness are. On the other hand, as Tecumseh said, it's a great opportunity. It means we have animal models of human cognitive processes, and we can ask questions with those models that can't otherwise be uh, readily uh, asked. One of those questions uh, uses this um, uh, obscene word that nobody uh, likes. I think people in this room. I like it quite a lot. You can use um, studies of animals to test for innateness in a strong sense. A stronger sense than learn, it will be regularly learned in, I forget what you said, you know, the natural environment. A stronger sense. The sense of innate that I want us to be able to test for is, do we have knowledge of X, any property in the world X, that's manifest on our very first encounter with X? Okay, that's, that's going to be my criterion for uh, innateness. That's very hard to test in human infant. For example, navigation studies, you've got to be able to get up and walk around. That's a game that kids get into uh, when they're a year old, if you mean bipedal walking, and not until they're six months, which is still plenty of time to learn lots of stuff, uh, if you mean crawling. Uh, but chicks start walking around pretty much at the moment of hatching, uh, allowing Giorgio Valortigar to do the following wonderful study. So here's the chick, chick again and learning uh, where mom is, and then, uh, to, to test the chick's reorientation ability, you let the chick learn for a couple of days uh, where mom is. And then you put the chick in a fully rectangular room, and while the chick is being confined in the center, uh, you show mom exiting through one corner of the room, and then you can spin the chick down. Okay. Now you could say, well, what about those first few days when the chick was uh, learning uh, about mom in the first place? Isn't that an opportunity to learn what environments are like and what they're relevant? features are. Well, to see if that's what was going on, uh, Lord Tagara ran uh, chicks in two different groups. One group uh, in a geometric, not acquainted with mom in a geometrically well-structured and formative environment. The other in a homogeneous circular environment. So no walls differing in length or distance, no corners of 
uh, distinctive uh, corners left or right of a longer or shorter wall, just a uniform circular environment. And then they tested the two groups and found absolutely no difference between them. They were equally good at using the shape of the room uh, to uh, reorient themselves. So I think that shows that this system of representation is a need in the strong sense of present and functional on first encounter with uh, the dog objects. So that's true for place representations. It's also true for object representations. I wish I had time to tell you. Uh, you should look it up. It's such a beautiful study about Valor Tagara's uh, studies of solidity, where he, raised, he manages to raise tricks in a world where they never see objects collide with each other, and they also never experience a collision with a visible object. Actually, I'm telling you about it. Very case with plexiglass. And then you can ask. So the only thing that's solid in their experience is this invisible medium that's surrounding them. Uh, but mom is beyond that plexiglass, this, this ping pong ball or whatever they're printing to, is beyond that plexiglass. And she's there dangling in the air, never colliding with anything. And the question is, does the chick think she's solid? So then you run some experiments in this sort of thing. Yes. Also, yes, for um, uh, representations of agents and goal efficient corrective actions. The other cases I put question marks because I think strong tests which require first to establish that there's a homology here, that they're using the same system we use, and second that you test in detail for the signature limits of the performance. And I think there's there's more work to do on that. Yeah, to come to uh, that was the two minute sign of your twenty two minutes, don't tell me that. Oh no. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so same strategy of testing for signatures can be used on older children and adults to ask them are these systems just scaffolding that we need when we're infants, but then we're going to kick them away and understand the world in some completely different way when we get older? Well, if they're just scaffolding, then we shouldn't be able to find anything in the mind of an adult that shows the same signature limits as what we see in these infants. But if the systems continue to exist uh, over development, then we should be able to find some situations Especially situations where we can disable, we can disable other fancier abilities that we have, where we still see the systems at work. And let me give you just one example of that from our representations of objects. This is work research from the lab of Brian Scholl at Yale, and it uses a task on adults and also children called multiple object tracking. It's very similar in conception to the kind of tracking that Lisa was talking about uh, in her test. So you see a whole bunch of objects. A subset of them flash, and that means pay attention to those objects. And then everything starts moving around. And the question is, are you able to keep track of that subset of uh, uh, objects? And in the basic experiment, each of the objects behaves in accord with the constraints on infants' object representations. And when they do, you see it, and you see adults succeeding at this task. But in other, otherwise very similar conditions, the objects violate one or another constraints on infant's object representations. Here's the simplest possible violation. You simply take this very same array, but now you connect pairs of objects with expandable, contractible uh, lines. So they aren't separate bodies now. The two, they're not two distinct objects, it's one connected. Oh, goodness. Body. Um, okay, just okay. Um, and now people fall apart. They can't do it anymore. Okay, so uh, I think all the core systems continue to function in adults. I think they continue to function across uh, cultures. Uh, and again, the evidence is you see the same kind of success and failure across uh, uh, different uh, cultures. The ones that have been tested systematically, I think, have been found to be universal across cultures. But here, there's more we should be testing. Uh, they can be tested at multiple levels. You can go into the brain and you can look for region. This is, this is the strategy that Stan was applying to constituent structure in his talk. Look for signatures of constituent structure that we know about from behavioral experiments and see if we can find brain regions or individual neurons in the brain of a rat that show those signatures. And you can do that. It's a beautiful story. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to let myself tell you about it. And you can also look for a rationale for these signatures in computational and uh, problems that core knowledge systems solve. I'm not going to tell you about that uh, either. Uh, finally, the one thing I do want to say <laughs> is that it's not only the case that core systems continue to exist across development. It's that we use these core systems when we do things that go beyond them. 
And there's evidence for this in a number of different cases, but the strongest evidence is in the case of symbolic <coughs> mathematics. So obviously, when we, we've just been talking about these examples where when we learn um, number words, when we learn counting, when we learn um, grammatical uh, expressions that convey uh, uh, numerical uh, content, we go beyond the limits of an approximate number system and can represent number exactly. Nevertheless, when we calculate the exact numbers, we do show signatures of the number system that's existed in us since infancy. So we're faster uh, at uh, given an addition, an exact addition problem. We're faster at detecting a wrong answer that's got a large ratio of separation from the right answer than we are at detecting one that's close uh, to the right answer. We also activate the same brain regions when we calculate the symbolic numbers that we activate non-symbolic numbers. Um, if someone has a stroke or fails to develop normal um, core numerical representations because of developmental disabilities, they'll show corresponding deficits in symbolic uh, number uh, representations. And work by Justin Alberta and Lisa and others show that you can predict how good someone will be at symbolic uh, uh, mathematics from their performance on non-symbolic uh, numerical tasks. So they aren't just scaffolding that we kick out of the way when we learn new symbolic systems we continue um, to uh, use them. And that's been shown clearly, I think, in three of these domains. It needs to be studied more um, in the other ones. So just two minutes over, not too bad. I'm at the end of um, uh, telling you everything I know about infants. Here's the summary. We have this, um, we, our, our lives begin with these cognitive systems that are domain-specific, systematic, productive, innate. Early emerging in humans, um, persisting over later development, universal across cultures, and they underpin uh, our development and use. Of, I didn't tell you that they underpin our development, but they do. And use of uniquely human cultural variable things like uh, symbolic uh, mathematics. Uh, but in each, in the case of each of these systems, we also see that each one is limited. They apply to some things, but not other things. So a little frame on the floor in the shape of a rectangle, but not a big black uh, two-dimensional pattern on the floor in the same shape. So each system is limited. Each system is shared by other animals. Uh, and animals don't readily combine representations. They're, they don't readily solve the tasks efficiently. Those tasks require that you combine representations across these domains. And I want to spend a minute talking about that kind of difference because that will be my introduction to what I think is miss what I think we need to add to this picture to uh, to get to um, the human cognition. So let me just go back to the reorientation situation to illustrate a limit to the productive combinatorial power of uh, rat. So the very first studies that were ever done on reorientation were done by Ken Chang and Randy Gallistel. They worked the same way as the child uh, studies. You showed a rat, hungry rat, where food was, then spun them around so they were disoriented, and then went and saw where they dug for the food. And if you hit it over here, they would dig in two locations, the correct one and the opposite one. They did this uh, showing that they reorient by the roughly by the shape, the rectangular shape of this uh, environment. Uh, but in, in these original experiments, because the walls differed in color and the corners differed in patterns, this also showed that in this case, and many others, though not all others, they also failed to reorient by the landmarks. Okay. Now, Chang, in this very first experiment, asked, why don't they reorient by those landmarks? Could I get them to reorient by the landmarks if I trained them? So he, he ran an experiment where he gave individual rats large, large numbers of trials, and always over trials, there was the same local landmark, say this gray panel over here, that specified where the food was. Okay. Um, and what he found over trials was that rats learned to dig only at that location where the landmark was. Right. So far, so good. But he also looked at the paths they followed. And he found that on some trials, they, they started in the middle, they went like that. And on other trials, they went like that, looked up, turned around, and went the other way. Uh, suggesting that what they were doing is they were able to engage, they learned to engage two processes. They had this basic reorientation system that they had all along, and they also had the system for homing in on the appropriate landmark. They engaged both of them, but 
But they seem to engage them in sequence. They didn't seem to be able to unify them into a single integrated representation um, of the uh, environment. Now that's rats. I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm sorry to come say you didn't talk about ants. You didn't go back <laughs> far enough, okay? I have got to give a talk a linguist in the room where I talk about ants. So I'm going to give you one more example of um, combining core concepts in a non-human animal. It comes from the Gigantiops destructor. Ants being studied by a French group, actually. Um, and uh, they did the same reorientation experiments. So basically, they, 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 the task they used was these, these guys live in the Amazon, and they like to go out and forage, and then they find food, and they take it home. So what they did is they set up an environment where the X marks where their nest is, that's home, that's where they want to get back to. They wander around, and they're allowed to find food in this location here. And then they go through a period of training where once they find the food, a rectangular frame is placed around them with exits at all four corners. So they got to go out of corner. To, the, 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 it's actually it's a leaf that they're finding. Oh, I don't know why it's being done in France. They use fermentation, right? So they find the leaf, they take it back to the nest, they ferment it, and then they have the fresh <laughs> 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 um, So they go out through the Each individual ant, they could go through any of the four corners, but each individual ant will tend to select one corner to go home in. There's no disorientation yet. This is just learning. I'm going to find food here. I'll go out this way, and I'll get it back to the nest, and we'll start. Okay. So that's the basic task, and then what they were able to do once the ants learned that task was let them find, uh, surround the, put this rectangle, this whole array here, within a homogeneous surround, so there's no, no information available other than the geometric shape provided by the rectangle, and four other geometrical patterns, which they had shown in lots of past research, the ants could detect and discriminate and learn about. Okay. So they've got the four patterns they thought of. The, uh, the big rectangle, the ant finds food in the center, he's spun around and disoriented, and the question is what uh, corner will he use to go home? And he does what the rats do, goes half the time to the correct corner, half the time to the opposite one, showing use of the shape of the room and not use of the uh, little, uh, local uh, landmarks. And then they asked what Chang asked, uh, what will happen if we train them, that we make it worth their while to only use a local landmark. So they blocked off three of the four exits and gave the ants extensive training. Okay? And what happened over training was uh, the first and most basic measure is which corner do you first stick your nose into if you're an ant? And the answer was after extensive training on more than 90% of the trials, it was the correct corner. But then the next question was what paths do you follow? And here they are. On half of the trials, they go straight to the correct corner. On the other half, they go almost all the way to the yeah. other one, look up, and then um, turn around. Uh, so I think what we're seeing here, maybe, is the same two processes in the ant that we see in the uh, rat. Um, and uh, uh, we're also seeing that there are two kinds of entities in the world to which we will give the same geometric description. We'll apply Euclidean geometry both to this rectangle and to these little forms, but that both the ants and the rats are, and young children are giving different geometrical uh, uh, descriptions too. And finally, we're seeing that they're not readily defined. Um, so now I want to go back to humans, because if you take the reorientation studies, I told you that instead of running them on a two-year-old child, uh, you run them on an adult, uh, you get very different uh, performance. You'll get people going only to the single, uniquely correct location in a rectangular environment. If there's any uh, landmark at all that distinguishes the two geometrically equivalent corners, and we've never seen anyone start to go the wrong way, then correct themselves, and then go back to the other way. You know, immediately, if you ask them why they've done this, they look at you like you're a little bit of an idiot, and they say, well, obviously, you hit it next to the red wall, what do you think I was going to do? I uh, used uh, the red wall. So the question that uh, that I want to ask then, I think this gives us an opportunity to use studies of uh, cognitive development and also studies of people living in different circumstances, uh, different, uh, with different abilities. Um, where this ability comes from? How do you go from the ant or the rat, the young child pattern uh, to uh, this pattern? So as I said, I'm trying to use studies of support and cognitive development and also some work on adults uh, to address that question. So first of all, when do we see the change in children? Uh, not an interesting question in itself, but they can be important for 
precursor question, but at, at around four years of age, they're still making this error, but somewhere between five and seven years, the adult life pattern starts to emerge. And if you test um, a group of children at these intermediate ages, what uh, Linda Hermer has his head on was a correlation, simple correlation, uh, between how likely a child was to show the adult pattern of only going to the uh, correct location um, and how good their productive command was of the spatial expressions of <coughs> the terms left and right. So the kids who were better at um, uh, correctly performing a, a, a requested action when the action was put the blue ball to the left and the red ball, kids who did that better uh, were more likely to succeed in this task. Now that's just um, a correlation, uh, and it's open to multiple interpretations, but it raises the possibility that spatial language does some kind of work for us uh, when uh, we are uh, navigating in a situation that, that draws on not one, but two uh, early development systems. So, so how do we test that possibility? Well, I think the work that um, uh, Susan and uh, uh, Judy and Marie talked about a few days ago and very recently today uh, provides a real opportunity to test for causal relationships between specific aspects of language uh, development and specific uh, later development uh, cognitive capacities. Uh, and I want to give just uh, one example of that, focusing on this case of spatial represent representation. And this is work that was done on uh, two cohorts of speakers, I think the first and the second cohorts of speakers of uh, Nicaraguan Sign Language, who had been reported by Annie Senkas to differ in their uh, spatial language in some interesting ways. And, and uh, there were actually five interesting ways that we tested, but I'm only going to focus on two of them. First of all, the second cohort, the one who, was lear who learned Nicaraguan Sign Language from others who were already speaking Nicaraguan Sign Language, the second cohort was very consistent uh, over the course of a conversation in where they placed gestures in space. So if they're talking about a particular object, they put it here, and later on they wanted to refer to the object again, they would point to that same location where they placed the object before. Uh, but the first cohort speaker, uh, speakers were less consistent. Uh, there was also a difference in the consistency of use of frames of reference for specifying left and right uh, directions. So the second cohort speakers would decide early in a conversation if left and right were going to matter. So Andy made them talk about where things were with respect to each other and they differed in their left and right relationships. If this was going to matter, they decided at the outset, okay, when we say left, we're going to mean the side near the door. We're going to mean your left, not my left. The first cohort speakers were less consistent about how they would shift within the middle of a conversation from one frame of reference to another. And for both of these reasons, not surprisingly, Sanders showed that the first cohort speakers made more errors when they had to communicate about space than the um, second uh, cohort speakers did. So I think this is, provides a nice opportunity for testing whether these differences in command of spatial language actually are reflected in the non-linguistic navigation patterns shown by these speakers. So uh, to address this, uh, Jenny Pyers and Anna Schusterman went to Nicaragua with a portable rectangular room, uh, three gray walls, uh, one red wall, uh, and they spun first and second cohort speakers around and saw how they uh, reoriented themselves. They also did a second uh, navigation, well, a second test that doesn't involve navigation, but involves object representation. They had a shoebox that had one red side, three uh, gray sides, and they spun the shoebox around. Another spatial test, but not the same kind uh, of spatial test. So, uh, and they measured people's spatial language, five different aspects of spatial language, including the two that I just described. So on the reorientation test, the second cohort, not surprisingly, did extremely well. The first cohort did far better than a rat and an or an 18-month-old, but also reliably less well than the uh, second cohort, and distinguishing between those two geometrically appropriate um, corners. Uh, and most important, across the two cohorts, success on this test correlated specifically with consistency of left-right language and not with any of the other language measures, including the other spatial language measure. On the other hand, on the box search test, there was also a difference between the cohorts, and it correlated with a different aspect of spatial language, the other one, that consistency of placement um, an object within the space. 
Um, so I think what this says is that left-right spatial language is specifically enhancing navigation by landmarks, the use of this integrated kind of representation. It also says that the language has other effects. This is by no means the only effect we're seeing here. There's another one that's happening over here. And finally, everybody's about chance. So we're not seeing here what, what performance you get um, in a, uh, we're not we're not creating ant performance here. On the other hand, everybody also has some language. We're not seeing what performance is like in the language at all. So I'm not going to do it. I was going to talk about home signers and what what home signers do on this test, um, but I'm not going to do it uh, because I can see that I'm running uh, low on time, and I promise you guys I'm going to do that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I can give you the the, the, the bottom line. Uh, home signers abjectly fail both the spatial language. Adult, and adult, well, a 13-year-old or something. I've checked with those classes. Okay, um, how could language, what, what work could language be doing in this case? Um, here's a hypothesis. Uh, in my old-fashioned terms, language is consistent words and rules. I hope there's some newer way of saying that, maybe cognitive and functional um, elements and verge, of course. Um, the key difference, though, is that, that, that I think is crucial for these tasks, is that words can be coined for entities in any conceptual building. So you can, you can coin terms to talk about places in the environment, to talk about colors of walls, to talk about different kinds of objects, to talk about different um, spatial uh, relationships. But when you do, rules apply to those words only relative to their grammatical properties, not to their content. Okay? So if you can say left of the far wall, and you can say at red wall, you can say left of the red wall. Okay? Uh, you don't, you, you have a representational system that allows you to combine elements from different domains. And the complexity of those combinations depends only on the grammatical properties of those elements, not on the content domains that they come from. In that sense, I mean, natural language is, is a domain general combinatorial um, system. It, it has its own specific biological given domain specific properties. But what it allows for is a dumb general system of um, conceptual combination. So how does that work in the specific case? Well, child goes around the world, observes a layout with distinctive geometry, distinctive distances and directions, and learns some expressions that she can use uh, to describe locations in that layout. She also goes around the world and observes objects and, and uh, other entities with different properties and learns expressions that, that uh, can refer to them. And now she can use the combinatorial um, uh, rules of her language to combine elements from these expressions into new combinations. And the great thing about language is you get the meaning of this combination for free. You don't need to learn it. That's how you solve Jerry Fodor's problem of how could you ever get a concept that you didn't have before. You had the elements of the concept before. The ant has all the elements of the concept. It doesn't have a system for combining them together. But when the child learns to learn language, she gains such a system. And uh, the meanings of these combinations come from the meanings of the parts and the meanings of the uh, uh, environment. So I think language could be providing a medium in this case for providing this information productively to integrate uh, representations. So uh, if that's right, I want to come back to my um, uh, original questions. You know, where could our object ideas come from? I haven't given you any evidence on that yet, but if I had a second talk to give, uh, which you'll have me to know I'm not going to do, <laughs> what I would argue is that we use the productive combinatorial power of natural language uh, to form a number of our most conspicuously uniquely human and most useful uh, systems of knowledge. And here are the ones that I think are the best candidates for systems that we construct by com productively combining across their names. Uh, first of all, <coughs> Ergo Chibra uh, talked about uh, natural kind concepts, but a lot of people had questions like, what do natural kind concepts amount to in the human mind, and what do they uh, come from? Uh, and here's a stab at an answer that I think comes from research by uh, Fei Shu, which I prepared a bunch of slides on in case it comes up in the discussion that I won't give to you now, uh, that initially, for a child, the first words that they learn that refer to entities in the world are names uh, for kinds of objects, where a kind of object is a spatiotemporal body uh, with a particular structural form 
uh, that is structured in such a way as to fulfill a function in the service of some goal directed action by some agent. Now, uh, if the uh, object is an animal, then the agent might be itself, and the form might be the body parts and all that we see in the earlier If the object is an artifact, though, uh, it's crucially the fact that words can map to representations from these three different core systems that allows a child to see immediately as they confront some new thing in the world that there's potentially something there that has some dedicated uh, function that has a whole set of mechanical properties that we get from the object system and that functions yeah, in the service of some goal uh, directed action by virtue of its geometrical uh, structure. And there's lots of evidence that uh, from, from beautiful work by uh, Fei Shu, that it's when children learn words for kinds of objects, and also before they learn words for kinds of objects, but when they hear other people in the right grammatical context say things like, look, here's a blippet, nonsense object, right? Applied to something, they make the inference that's a kind of thing, uh, it's going to have a dedicated shape that distinguishes it from other things, and it's going to have a dedicated function. If it's inanimate, it'll be a dedicated tool like it. Artifact of function, and the, uh, these words combine this information uh, together and allow these kind representations to uh, serve as a coin in the realm for now connecting, uh, filling out, and, and expanding on the notion of what a natural kind can be uh, by connecting these representations from these three systems with all the other representations from other systems as children learn to lexicalize them and uh, uh, form expressions and find information across them. And I think this is why we see what are otherwise really puzzling phenomena in children and not in other animals. One is that we develop encyclopedic knowledge of object kinds. Other animals learn about kinds when Darwin tells them it's important to, or when some experimental psychologist hits them over the head with massive training. <laughs> we learn about uh, new kinds just by observing something once. Uh, and if we observe it once when nobody's named it for us, we're apt to turn to them and say, what is it by which we mean? Tell us what its name is and maybe tell us what it's for. You know, show, show me what it's for, okay? Kids are doing that all the time about everything. And I, and I, and I think that our prolific uh, and universal tool use stems from uh, the, this kind of representation that kids are starting to construct at the end of the first year. It also explains something that otherwise I think would be really puzzling, which is that both for adults and for children, even if you're in a situation that's completely non-communicative. So I'm going to show you this slide. All right, this is a task that's been run with adults. Here's your task. I'm going to show you a picture. And then you're going to see an array that has four pictures in them. And one of them is visually identical to the first picture that I showed you. All you have to do is push it, or there may be nothing in there that's visually identical to the first picture I showed you. And half the trials that we want will see the same picture push a button as fast as you can when you see is there or isn't there this picture on this slide okay and here's a trial obviously for that picture is there okay here's the finding you are slower to push this button if this object is there than if it isn't okay why well this is a boy he's not very well drawn you probably can't see him take my word for it uh, in the study of my article, I just, I just copied this from their paper. Uh, that's a picture of a boy. Uh, and this is a picture of a boy, right? Uh, the thing in the water. Okay, so they got the same sounding thing. Now, this is a task of visual, visual matching. Uh, there's no other person there. You're looking at a computer, you're pushing the button, you're an adult. And damn it, you're looking at this first thing and you're activating the name uh, boy. And you're looking at these four things, and you're activating a name that sounds the same and it's slowing you down. <coughs> now, that's a highly unadaptive thing to do. You would be faster if you didn't do that, but we do it, right? So do uh, 18 month old infants. Uh, paradigm is a little different. You show a baby, uh, an 18 month old, two objects, and you say, look at the cup. They're looking at the center between them, and you say, look at the cup. And the only question is, how fast do their eyes get the cup? Previously, you've shown them another picture. And if it was a picture of a dog, they'll be a little slower to get to the cup than if it was a picture of a cat. Why? Phonological overlap uh, uh, in the name. Even though this object is not being named, the child is not being told to name it, the child is not being in a negative context, the child sees a picture of a cat, and somewhere it's activating a representation of the word cat. I think this would be deeply puzzling if 
language were purely an instrument of communication. I think it says there's something deeply right uh, about Chomsky's claim that it's an instrument of thought. We activate the word because with that word comes this package of information that connects this visual design or uh, this, this visual pattern uh, to a system of knowledge of object uh, kinds. Okay. Uh, there's data to support that, but I won't um, uh, go through it. I do want to get, though, the last thing I want to do uh, is I promised also in my talk that I would talk about unanswered questions. So let me just see if I can get somewhere that the unanswered questions are. I'm sorry, that's going to be the back of the I'm not going to get into the slides. Oh, I see. So the data on <coughs> object lines. Um, okay, so my summary was just that core systems, Core systems and language, how do we put these things together? Um, I think core systems are both the basis for language learning and, in important ways, the foundations for our later developing uh, uniquely human systems of uh, knowledge of, of, of the world. Um, but I also think that natural language gives us um, a cognitive capacity that's unique to humans uh, that has nothing to do with communication between one person and another but has a great deal to do with communication between different concepts and different cognitive systems within the individual mind by allowing us to uh, uh, productively combine them uh, for free with no extra learning. Any animal can learn to combine one particular concept with another. We can structure new systems of knowledge uh, by uh, combining those um, systems of concepts. And I think that's a capacity that's critical. Uh, and has been, uh, and there's evidence that it's playing a role in um, um, each of the cases uh, that I listed there. Um, but I do think, and this is um, my last slide, that if, if there's anything to this account that raises questions that made me very happy when I was invited to this meeting, uh, it raises questions I think that uh, uh, are going to be very hard to answer, but that we might be able to make headway on uh, through productive collaboration between uh, linguists and other uh, <coughs> cognitive scientists. Um, first of all, I think this account requires a very strongly nativist theory of language acquisition. And the reason for that uh, is simple. All the child has at the point where language acquisition begins, I submit, are the set of distinct core systems plus a language faculty. They don't have any fancy or uniquely human ways of communicating, as Tom Seller has proposed, for example, that you could use to bootstrap language. They don't, I think, have natural number, which I don't know that anyone has proposed this, but you might imagine that some other fancy symbolic system so as to bootstrap uh, language or logic, okay, symbolic logic of some sort, uh, might, uh, one might be able to develop a counter language acquisition that depended on that. But if this hypothesis is right, I can't help myself to any of um, those accounts. So I think um, uh, the only account of language acquisition that, that's compatible with an account like this is a strongly nativist one. But that raises questions. What is the innate language faculty like? Um, and especially, how does it, uh, you know, how does it relate to our, the other kinds of cognitive, uh, innate cognitive capacities that we find in humans and in other animals? I think that, that becomes an um, important question for research. Another important question for research is, how do natural language expressions map onto the representations that other core systems deliver? How do you uh, use your core representations of objects and forms and places and numbers to learn words like like and seven and you know, all the other uh, uh, words and expressions of the language that uh, children learn? And finally, and most importantly, um, how is it that we get from left of the, uh, just the far wall and red to left of the red wall? How do, how do, where does the, the uh, both the combinatorial uh, syntax and the compositional semantics of natural language come from, such that uh, it has this productivity and this obvious um, potential cognitive advantage to it. Now, I don't have the answer to any of those questions, and I also don't think we will get them purely from research and cognitive development. But I do hope that the kind of interdisciplinary research that the community is organized uh, uh, to, to, to stimulate uh, could help.